How many people have you seen die in person? How many times have you actually seen a person in their final moments? If you're like most people, probably not many. Death is dealt with by a minority of people in our society. Doctors, nurses, first responders, soldiers. But as for the rest of us, for the most part, we shelter ourselves from the reality of death. But in ancient Rome, things were very different. Death was ubiquitous. The average Roman probably witnessed hundreds of people die, not just from disease or warfare or accidents, but in the sporting arena, dying violent, gory deaths for entertainment. People gathered in massive, frenzied crowds to watch men kill one another in gladiatorial fights, and to watch people being literally torn apart by animals. According to the Roman statesman Cicero, these spectacles were attended by immense numbers and by every class of men, and the multitudes were delighted by them above all things. People would lose their minds at places like the Colosseum, frantically cheering and immersing themselves in the Roman death games like modern sports fanatics. The Christian philosopher Augustine of Hippo, who lived in the 4th century, describes how his friend Olypius essentially got a buzz from watching the gladiators fight. It's a fascinating account because, according to Augustine, Olypius had previously showed a revulsion to the games. He denounced them, he thought they were wrong, immoral, but some of his friends ganged up on him and literally forced him to go to the games during their most savage and cruel displays. Augustine says, when they were inside and had found what seats they could, everything was a frenzy of extravagant excess. Olypius shut his eyes to seal in his soul against this evil. But when one of the combatants fell in the fight, a huge roar from the crowd crashed over him. That shout entering his ears made his eyes fly open. The minute he saw blood, he was sipping animality. And he turned no more away. With eyes glued to the spectacle, he absentmindedly gulped down frenzies. He took a complicit joy in the fighting and was drunk with delight at the cruelty. He stared, he shouted, he burned. He took away the madness he found there. Olypius essentially got a euphoric high on watching people kill and be killed. Even if we assume that this account is exaggerated, the fanatic bloodlust of the Roman people is corroborated by another Roman philosopher, Seneca, in his seventh letter to Lucilius. There was just something about the games that flipped a switch in people. And we are left wondering why on earth these horrors caused such a thrill. None of these philosophers explained to us what it was about the games that made people like Olypius so excited. Seneca chalks it up partly to the, the power of the crowd, the power of mobs to sweep us up and make us one of them at a lizard brain level. If you've been in a full stadium when a massive cheer goes up, you know how powerful it is at a physiological level. It acts upon your body as well as your mind. Augustine seems to have been making the same point, but that doesn't explain why the crowd gets excited about death in the first place. Indeed, Augustine seems to suggest that the mere sight of blood, or the death blow, affected the Romans at a physiological level, provoking an intense excitement out of them. The question is, why? Were the Romans simply depraved monsters? What other conclusion can we come to when it seems impossible to understand them, or to put ourselves in their shoes? They seem so foreign to us, so different. But then again, maybe not. Enter the modern horror film. The 1970s were the time in American cinema when horror films became blockbusters, and horror became a cultural phenomenon producing modern horror icons that rivaled the monsters of the Universal Studios films. Not least among these were the slasher icons, Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, and others. The 21st century saw the rise and increasing popularity of splatter films, like the Saw franchise, films whose appeal is based squarely on the spectacle of violence and gore. So at first blush, it would seem that we still go to be thrilled and entertained by death, albeit, in a fictional medium. 
You might argue that there is no comparison between the Colosseum and the modern cinema, for in the Colosseum, death was a sport that made people cheer like touchdowns in football or home runs in baseball, while horror films are not meant to make us cheer, but rather to make us cringe. And there's something to be said for this. Of course, they are different in many respects, yet in some very important ways, they are very, very similar. A relevant example comes from an interview with the creators of the Saw franchise, who point out that the crowd at the Toronto Film Festival was, quote, rowdy during the showing of the first Saw film. Quote, the Midnight Madness crowd is a much more bloodthirsty crowd, and take that for what it's worth. What's more important is that at a conceptual level, there is a game element in horror films, especially slasher and splatter films, which put horror films squarely in the same genus as gladiator fights and execution by wild animal. Horror films gamify death just as the Roman arena gamified death. The game in question might be different, but the game is what makes it interesting in each case. Slasher films are entertaining because it's a game of chase or hide and seek. The victims have a chance to run away or fight back. Other films like the Saw movies are gripping because they are high stakes puzzles. They present a challenging scenario, a trap to escape. At any rate, Every horror film is driven by an underlying challenge or contest, a question to solve. How do you survive Hitchcock's The Birds? How do you defeat a villain that seems invincible? How do you kill an alien who bleeds acid? How do you evade and eliminate the threat of Pennywise the Clown? Action movies often ask the same question. How do you defeat Thanos or the Joker or the Terminator? But what sets horror films apart from action is that horror films make us feel the stakes. When the film Man of Steel came out, I remember people criticized it because we see an entire city destroyed and we feel nothing, even though it probably ruined a lot of lives and killed a lot of people, but we don't feel it as a tragedy. That's true of a lot of superhero films. But in a horror film, when just one person dies, it feels more horrible than the destruction of a whole city. Because in a sense, the person who dies is losing more than a city. They are losing everything. And horror films use techniques to directly attack our senses and our psychology in order to make us feel this. They use camera angles and foreboding music and jump scares to make us feel what that character in danger is feeling. They make us feel the tragedy and panic of loss and death. Gladiator fights no doubt have much the same effect. Gladiator fights give us a sense of reality. The only difference is that you don't need music or jump scares when you are watching the real thing, when you are watching someone really kill and really die. When we watch games where everything is at stake, there's a sense of profound reality to it. I think one of the best tools for understanding the appeal of gladiator fights is Ernest Hemingway's book on the Spanish bullfights, Death in the Afternoon. The premise of the bullfights, like gladiator fights, hinges on death. The goal is to kill the bull, and for the matador to put himself at the greatest possible risk of goring or death to get as close as possible to the horns in the process of killing the bull. It's something that you may very well have found in the Roman Colosseum, and Hemingway had to explain to English audiences the rationale for this kind of entertainment, killing bulls, or watching men genuinely risk their lives for fun. Why would anyone enjoy this? Hemingway had this to say. So far about morals, I only know that what is moral is what you feel good after, and what is immoral is what you feel bad after. And judged by these moral standards, which I do not defend, the bullfight is very moral to me, because I feel very fine while it is going on, and have a feeling of life and death and mortality and immortality. And after it is over, I feel very sad, but very fine. There are two key takeaways from this. First is the feeling of life, death, mortality, and immortality. The spectacle of killing makes us feel things that we don't get to experience in everyday life. We generally don't feel mortal or immortal, waking up and going to work or school or hanging out with friends. But when we watch the act of risk-taking and killing and dying, life becomes more real for us. Hemingway later goes on to explain that during the faena, the final pass that leads to the killing of the bull, 
or the possible goring of the bullfighter, you experience this profound effect. The faena takes a man out of himself and makes him feel immortal while it is proceeding. It gives him an ecstasy that is, while momentary, as profound as any religious ecstasy, moving all the people in the ring together and increasing in emotional intensity as it proceeds, carrying the bullfighter with it, he playing on the crowd through the bull and being moved as it responds in a growing ecstasy of ordered, formal, passionate, increasing disregard for death that leaves you when it is over and the death administered to the animal that has made it possible, as empty, as changed, and as sad as any major emotion will leave you. The bullfighter is performing a work of art and is playing with the death, bringing it closer and closer and closer to himself, a death that you know is in the horns because you have the canvas-covered bodies of the horses on the sand to prove it. He gives you a feeling of his immortality, and as you watch it, it becomes yours. Then when it belongs to both of you, he proves it with the sword. By playing with death, the bullfighter gives you a sense of immortality. And this, I believe, was why the gladiatorial games were so popular. It gave the Romans who watched a sense of rapturous immortality, which they craved. And I believe the same is true of horror films. By watching people play with death, narrowly evading it, or even falling victim to it, we get a profound sense of life and death. A sense that we don't have in our days at the office or factory or binging on Netflix. By witnessing death and killing, these things come alive in our consciousness as felt realities. In such a state, the suchness of things can break through into consciousness. Granted, the effect is different depending on whom you identify with, the killer or the victim. When you identify with the triumphant killer, as the Romans most often did, you feel for a brief moment invincible, a surge of power, the taking away of everything a person has in one blow. When you identify with the people who are defeated, or killed, or threatened, or being hunted, as in horror films, then you feel the expansive and breathtaking value of life, because you are overwhelmed by what is lost, and what might be lost. When we mentally put ourselves in the experience of the gladiator dying in front of us, or of the slasher victim, or of the dying bull, and we feel what we are losing, we feel afraid when it is happening, and sad when it is over. But we also feel very fine, very high, very elevated, because this sadness and this gloom is impressing on us how very valuable those things are. And it reminds us what it feels like to be meaningful beings ourselves, heady beyond all our comprehension. This mixture of terror, dread, and gloom, with joy, rapture, and satiation, is what the Romantic era philosophers called the sublime, a term which comes from the Latin word sublimis, meaning to be elevated, or lifted up, or high. It's the feeling of being on a mountain or on rooftops. It's the feeling of greatness, and vastness, and incalculable magnitude. A feeling of greatness which comes mainly from terrors and dangers. Now I can say for myself that this is why I personally keep going back to horror films. While I do generally steer clear of splatter films because I find them too revolting and too irreverent, and I personally find slashers to be generally uninteresting, I am drawn to other horror films because of this feeling of the sublime. In films like Psycho and Alien and The Shining, and even war films, the endings of Das Boot, Apocalypse Now, Paths of Glory, are all steeped in the elevated sadness of the sublime. If Edmund Burke is correct, the sublime is the strongest emotion the mind is capable of feeling. If Friedrich Schiller is correct, it's what completes human nature. And I think all of this has profound implications for life and how we understand human nature, and what it means to live a meaningful life as a human being. Dangers and threats are things that we need. They complete us. They make us feel sublime. Philosophically, we tend to treat suffering and evil as defects in the fabric of the universe. But emotionally, the sublime seems to suggest that danger is not a defect at all. Rather, it's a necessary condition to a meaningful existence. I personally think that the Genesis account of the Garden of Eden is unbelievably profound 
when it describes the ideal perfect paradise as a place which must be cultivated and kept. A Hebrew word meaning to watch over or guard or protect. Protected from whom? Presumably from the serpent who shows up later. At any rate, the takeaway is that the perfect world is not a world without threats, but a world in which there are real threats to fight against. The perfect paradise has dragons in it. The ideal man, fashioned directly by God, is a man who, like a protagonist in a horror film, rages against true and powerful evil. G.K. Chesterton made the point that evil, even powerful evil, is necessary for a beautiful world because we must have something to fight against. This world can be made beautiful again by beholding it as a battlefield. When we have defined and isolated the evil thing, the colors come back into everything else. There are some men who are dreary because they do not believe in God, but there are many others who are dreary because they do not believe in the devil. The grass grows green again when we believe in the devil. The roses grow red again when we believe in the devil. For the full value of this life can only be got by fighting. The violent take it by storm. Philosopher William James went even further when he argued in his lectures on pragmatism that we can only take life seriously when it is dangerous and when we accept that we must inevitably suffer loss and sacrifice. Life is meaningful only when the stakes are high. It's adventurous only when we might lose. But the fact of loss doesn't mean we shouldn't play. For as James says, quoting an ancient Greek epigram, a shipwrecked sailor buried on the coast bids you set sail. In the same way, every victim who dies in a horror film bids us live.